Okay, thank you. Uh, so let me thank the organizers for a uh, very kind invitation. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure uh, and also an honor to, to give this talk in, uh, for the celebration for Pier Marco. I have, uh, I must say, the highest admiration for, <laughs> for Pier Marco. And uh, when I think it's like uh, in sport, when you have this admiration for these players and you would like your favorite soccer team just to, to buy those kind of players. They are substantial, so, <laughs> so it's that, that's the way I see I mean, him in general. Okay. So it's one of the top players. Okay, so uh, I, I decided to uh, speak about this topic, which is uh, a little bit intermediate between uh, parabolic and uh, Hamilton-Jacobi equations. So it, perfectly fits by interpolation um, the interest, many of the interests of Pier Marco. Uh, so uh, in general, so just to uh, make clear the, the name, so viscous Hamilton Jacobi is referred to in general just to, uh, I mean, uh, if you want first order equation when you add some diffusion or if you prefer just a second order heat equation with first order terms. Uh, okay, I will simply focus on a very special uh, situation, which is when this Hamiltonian is the superquadratic power of the gradient. Uh, for people coming from parabolic equation, this is referred to uh, as going beyond the natural growth. And this is a source of new uh, phenomena. So essentially, the, the there are several unnatural things that are observed. And this is the reason why I going to review somehow some of those uh, phenomena which are quite uh, peculiar and this is why in my opinion they might be interesting. So the real maybe unnatural thing is to observe a second order equation sharing some behavior with first order equation that's really quite remarkable in my viewpoint and this is definitely due to this super quadratic growth in the coercive first order term. Okay, then you will see a sort of competition or say struggle between classical and viscosity solutions and uh, uh, appearance and, and disappearance of singularity. So it's like a quite, quite a strange phenomena. Uh, I decided in any case to focus on the evolution problem, even if, I mean, some of those phenomena were highlighted for stationary solutions first. Uh, in particular, I think with, uh, with Italo Capuzzo Dolcetta and Fabiana, we started looking at the stationary solution uh, some years ago, and then many other orders. I'm not going to look at a stationary solution. But today, I will, I will focus on the evolution problem, and, in, and even really on the very model <laughs> case, uh, when the domain is bounded, that, that will be crucial and smooth, and the initial datum is smooth, if you want, and satisfies at the beginning the compatibility condition uh, at a boundary. And this boundary will, will, will be important. So I will discuss the, say, more interesting case, which is the reaction case, uh, which means somehow that there is competition between diffusion and uh, first order terms. So in this, in this setting, the reaction is observed in the sign of solutions or in the sign of the initial data. So this implies that you will be positive. The main theme that I will discuss is blow up phenomena and, and blow down also phenomena. So it's, uh, this is, okay. So there are of course many, many contributions on this kind of equations in, in several different directions. So I'm, I will not, uh, I will just mention some, something which is related to things that I'm going to say, uh, among the others, but okay, I will also mention it later. I mean, Pierre Marco and jointly with Pierre also studied this kind of super quadratic regime in, in this diffusion equations. Okay, so uh, what is the Hamilton Jacobi, say, Bellman viewpoint? It's, it's relevant also to understand the kind of phenomena which I will describe later. So the solution admits natural interpretation as a value function. So this value function is uh, described in, in terms of a stochastic process. Actually, that's just a Brownian motion 
which you may figure out as controlled through the drift term here. And uh, uh, if you start in, in omega and you call tau x the first exit time from omega, then you can represent u of t of x and this, say, supremum, so it's the maximum somehow, of u0 at x t times the characteristic function, so this is if t is smaller than the exit time, minus the, the price somehow that you pay for using the control. What is peculiar here of the, of the super quadratic case? So, well, the optimal drift would be given in feedback form here by just, say, the, the, the gradient of the solution along the trajectory, scaled by this p minus 1. So, you see, when p is bigger than 2, this exponent here in the cost functional is smaller than, than 2. And uh, this means actually that the singular drifts are, are less expensive. And that's, that this is really the reason why you can observe this kind of phenomena, because you might be tempted to introduce singularity somehow in this uh, situation, and the singularities you might be willing to use means some unbounded, at some moment maybe, uh, drift, which of course, you pay some price for that, but maybe you gain something because of u0. That's the interpretation. Okay, so let me now go through the classical parabolic viewpoint on that. So you, you start from a smooth uh, solution, uh, zero at a boundary, and if u0 is c1, then uh, by classical theory there exists a maximal uh, time, if you want, there is a classical C1 solution, sorry, in a, in a, this is maybe badly written, in a, in a maximal time of existence, which can be finite or not, in principle. And uh, there are a few properties which are not difficult, of course, but the first one is, is elementary, is U is bounded by maximum principle, so this is immediate. Uh, but, the C1 norm, so you see this is a typical uh, local in time existence result in C1, for example. And, but, but the C1 norm of U of T may blow up. So this is concerned with gradient blow up of the solution. So the solution will not blow up in, in L infinity norm, but will blow up in the gradient L infinity norm. There are lots of contributions on this, on the question of blow up of classical solutions again. And uh, I mean, my, my co-author, I mean, uh, I will describe uh, mostly contribution with, uh, with Philippe Souple, of course, also was an expert uh, on this kind of topic before. Okay, so uh, there are some well-known facts established by, by Souple and collaboration also with Zhang in particular. So the, the first thing is that this gradient blow up certainly occurs if the initial datum is suitably large. And the gradient blow up can only occur at a boundary. So somehow this limits uh, the possibility of singularities to the boundary of the domain. And there is a uh, short proof to convince you of that. So first of all, you observe that U is, is bounded for all times. That's just maximum principle. Then by a translation argument uh, and an L infinity contraction, which is just a consequence again of maximum principle, if you want, uh, you observe that the translation in time of U are, are dominated by this uh, translation at any previous time. So it's enough to take some very small time T0 and then you, you just get a bound for the time derivative uh, for all for all times, and then if you look uh, at your equation, like as u of t, it's like a stationary solution of that. By using the stationary bounds by Lyons, you conclude that the gradient is, is bounded by a negative power of the distance to the boundary. Uh, so uh, you learn from that that uh, the time derivative is always bounded and the gradient is, is locally bounded inside, so the only singularity may be at the boundary. Uh, there is another Important, of course, uh, information that was also well known since a while, which is that there exists a unique uh, global in time, relaxed 
viscosity solution, which means a function which is continuous up to the boundary, which solves the equation in, in viscosity sense. This was established by, by Barl and Dalio in 2004. But be careful, this is an existence and, and uniqueness for uh, uh, viscosity solutions where the boundary condition is assumed in viscosity sense, which means it can be relaxed. So in particular, okay, here, this is simple, you don't need to know uh, any difficult uh, knowledge of viscosity solution. You observe immediately that the, the, the solution is super harmonic, super, say, so if you want, it's definitely greater than or uh, greater than or equal to zero at the boundary, but it can be strictly bigger than zero at the boundary. And in this case, uh, the inequality, the, the U must be a sub-solution in that case in viscosity sense. So that's the meaning. So in particular, this result means that the, the unique, uh, I mean, the, the classical solution which exists in small time admits for sure uh, a prolongation for uh, all time. So this is already an information on what is called the continuation after blow up. So the, the, the classical solution, if it blows up, and it, it is known that it will blow up in some cases, it will continue to exist as a viscosity solution. There are more general results on the, on the regularity of the solution, which uh, uh, even in more generality, I mean, it will be locally holder. So in my example, the solution will be locally Lipschitz, but actually in this kind of context, I mean, even the result by Barl and Dalio are, are very general. I mean, the existence and uniqueness of uh, relaxed, if you want, viscosity solutions. And in the same context, there are those results, I mean, which were proved by Pierre Marco and, and Pierre, and later on also by Pierre with Silvestre, and recently also other people uh, looked at the regularity result, which uh, say that there are also some regularizing effect which uh, are uh, given somehow by this, uh, uh, by this uh, extra coercive term, uh, even competing with, with, with uh, say, the diffusion. But okay, I'm not going to touch this kind of, of topic. Uh, okay, so uh, let me also mention that again for this very particular a uh, very special situation, you can also look at this generalized viscosity solution. You may look at it as the increasing limit of classical solutions of, of say, subquadratic gradient nonlinearity. So you may truncate your nonlinearities, you have classical solutions, and then uh, you, you just uh, leave the truncation uh, go away, and then you get an increasing sequence of solutions. The limit is locally uniform. So U is, is an increasing limit of classical solutions, so you immediately realize that there is a boundary layer problem here, and your solution may lose this boundary condition. That's also one explanation for people uh, to, to explain why there might be this loss of boundary solution. Uh, this loss of boundary solution certainly occurs for large initial data. I would like to give you a very simple <laughs> uh, proof of this, which is quite, I mean, uh, extractive, uh, you multiply your equation by the first second function of the Laplacian. You can do that because you can use this global viscosity solution, it's continuous function. So you multiply by that, okay, you, you pay a little bit of attention on this term, but believe me, you can justify this multiplication. And then you suppose that as long as u is zero on the boundary, you are allowed to use Poincaré inequality. So you can bound below this term here by Poincaré inequality. So you, you do a little bit of job. So first of all, you say, okay, u phi one, which appears here, can be dominated by some power of, of u, any power actually here bigger than one. Then you use Poincaré inequality here. And then you, here, if you choose suitably k, not too big, you can dominate this guy and this can be finite if k is not too large. Uh, phi one is like the distance function, the first second function. So you can dominate by this term. So this means that you can build here a nice inequality for this function with the superlinear power of the same function here. And, and this would lead to a blow up of this quantity, which is impossible because u is uniformly bounded by maximum principle. 
So this means, of course, this is impossible provided the initial, say, u0 against phi1 is sufficiently large because there is this constant here, so you pay some price. So if this guy is too large, necessarily at some moment you should lose the Poincaré inequality, which means that you lose the, the boundary value. And even you can comment, you, you, you lose it on, on a portion of the boundary, you don't need to lose it uh, everywhere. Okay. So this is also an explanation that you might lose this boundary behavior, okay? But there is more than that. This is something we uh, proved with Enrique Zuazua, motivated by a control problem that Enrique suggested at that time, uh, that we not only, okay, uh, we show that for all initial data, the solution eventually would, would decay to zero, but there is more than that, it is that there exists some time that you may roughly estimate proportional to the L-infinity norm of the initial data, such that U becomes a classical solution again after this time. So U not only is converging to zero, but it's actually going back to the original zero directly condition after some time, and then it also behaves like the heat equation later. So not only there is life after blow up, I would say, but there is also a happy ending, which means that whatever U0 is, the solutions will become eventually classical again. So that's a very strange phenomena that motivated my also collaboration with Philippe Souple, because now we knew that solutions necessarily were losing the boundary condition continue to exist as viscosity solution, but at some moment they came back to the boundary condition. So it's a very strange phenomena. Okay, so there are three things here to, uh, to try to investigate. The, the gradient blow up in this kind of problem, so maybe the blow up rate, the profile and so on. The loss of boundary condition, so when does it occur, how does it occur and so on. And the recovery of boundary condition. Okay, so it's like for us that we are recovering now our boundary conditions for these conferences, so like the coffee break and so on. So it's, it's nice to know that this kind of boundary conditions are maybe recovered at some moment. Okay, so this is something we investigated with, with Philippe. Uh, okay, let me start by the blow up uh, question. So uh, essentially we, we discussed uh, together somehow the blow up time so and also the regularization time so what is that we call the regularization time is somehow the ultimate time after which the solution remains classical forever so this is the because the solution might uh, might lose and uh, came back to the boundary condition several times okay so this is the ultimate time of regularization and in both cases what we showed is that the the blow up rate is at least at least of the order, uh, say, t star minus t of 1 over p minus 2. So this is the least uh, possible blow up rate and similar for the regularization time. Okay, so this, in that case, this is for t bigger than the regularization time. This is the blow up, uh, say, uh, or if you want a regularization rate. Uh, this rate is known, uh, okay, okay, let me give maybe a, a rough idea of that. So it, this is not completely true like that, but it's just give you an idea. So the idea is that, okay, you try to build, this is quite standard, an inequality for the blow up function of time, which is the L infinity norm of the gradient. Okay, so you use a property, which, okay, this is not uh, difficult to establish, that you can estimate the derivative, the absolute value, of this guy almost everywhere, etc. You can estimate that with the L infinity norm of the gradient of ut. And then you, you look at the equation satisfied by ut, which is essentially the linearized equation around your solution. And then, okay, you try to play a bit with the heat kernel estimates. Okay, this is this is not exactly in that form, but a similar estimate, which is it's like proving that this, this guy can be estimated again with the p minus one power of the gradient of u, which is your function m. So this is a way of building a kind of differential inequality for the function m of t 
from which you may at least deduce the least possible blow-up rate for, for the function. So the proof is a bit more involved because it doesn't run like that, but this was the, the basic idea. So this rate is known to be optimal in some cases. Uh, for example, for time-increasing solution in one-dimensional case, in radial cases. But it's true that faster blow-up rates also can occur. And I, I must say that this is not the self-similar rate of the equation. Uh, because the self-similar scaling would be of order 1 over p minus 1. Uh, when I say self-similar, so it's in a classical sense, it's, it's that if you uh, take, the, you have a family of self-similar solutions of the equations, which runs like that for m, which is this value here. And if you consider that the gradient of this, this would scale like uh, lambda to the 1 over p minus 1. Uh, so actually, uh, it's true that this rate, 1 over p minus 1, is the rate of the special, say, in space, the blow-up of the normal derivative. This was also uh, proved in more generality in a recent paper of Philippe with Filippucci and Pucci. Uh, what we had proved with Philippe a few years ago was that in a particular geometrical setting of a single point blow-up in two dimensions, we had proved that there was a strongly anisotropic blow up profile which was uh, 1 of p minus 1 in the normal uh, spatial space direction 1 over p minus 2 in in the in a time uh, say rate and 2 over p minus 2 in a tangential uh, spatial rate so this is something we had observed in a, in a particular setting it was not a complete result this is still uh, open to some extent so we had proved this uh, in, a, in, a, in a special configuration in two dimensional with some symmetric, say, configuration of the initial data, which was sort of, which gives this kind of property of solution. So the, the single point blow up is the origin in the plane here. So there is a plane uh, x, y, and uh, uh, zero, zero is the single blow up point of, at the boundary. And, uh, and so we prove an estimate for the, for the, normal, uh, for the normal derivative of, of u, uh, which, uh, which was, say, strongly anisotropic. So we could, we could describe somehow the profile in a, in a slightly, I mean, more explicit way. And in particular, this was showing that the, the normal derivative uh, of u at the origin was blowing up tangentially like this kind of, of behavior. But this, we could only prove that for p between 2 and 3, it's still uh, an open question whether this kind of blow-up profile exists for all powers of 2. But okay, so let me now go back to the problem of the loss of boundary condition. Uh, uh, this we described in a different paper with Philippe in uh, more or less at the same time. We prove that the loss of boundary condition may occur, may not occur, and of course this depends on the initial data. And in particular, we, we highlighted that uh, some property of this possible uh, loss of boundary condition. So one property was that uh, you, can, you can build initial data for which you have this loss of boundary condition everywhere on the boundary. Uh, this was also observed more or less at the same time by, by Alexander Koss and uh, Rodrigo at the set in more general setting of viscosity solutions. And uh, uh, essentially, uh, you can even more or less prepare a relatively open set of the boundary little omega, uh, more or less in a way that the singular set, so the, the blow-up set of, uh, at the boundary, it, contains this relatively open set of the boundary and it's contained in omega plus b epsilon zero. Okay, this, this is not a very, of course, fine description of the, of the boundary set uh, at which a, a solution may blow up, but it just says that depending on the initial uh, function u zero, you may, you may build the initial function in a way that you have this blow up localized on any relatively open set of the boundary. And uh, also we had observed at that time that the gradient blow up may occur uh, with or without the loss of boundary conditions. So in particular, 
uh, a typical, uh, there is a typical threshold that you may observe with this very classical, say, dilation argument. You fix your initial datum u0, and then you consider all the, say, the line lambda u0, and then you consider the, the infimum of lambda for which uh, actually the blow up time is, is finite. And this you call it lambda bar, and then uh, so for lambda bigger than lambda bar, you have blow up. When I, blow up is always means gradient blow up, and always means gradient blow up at the boundary. Uh, so u lambda blows up uh, in the sense of the gradient blow up, if and only if lambda is larger than lambda bar. And, but in this case, u lambda loses the boundary value if and only if lambda is strictly bigger than lambda bar. At the, at the limiting case, at lambda bar, then uh, you have a gradient blow up without losing the boundary condition. So there is a threshold uh, between uh, global in time smooth solutions and solutions with loss of boundary condition. And this distinguishes between what we will call minimal blow up solutions and no minimal ones. So minimal blow up solution is a solution such that whenever you, you start below, differently than your initial data, then the corresponding solution uh, is smooth for all time. So that's what we call a minimal blow-up solution. And in general, the minimal blow-up solutions should, may and, and should actually have faster blow-up rates because they become singular but they are immediately regularized. So somehow you expect this blow-up to occur at faster rate than 1 over p minus 2 that I, I described before. Okay, so then we, we try to describe a little bit more precisely this kind of phenomena, at least in, in one particular setting, and we did it in, in the one-dimensional case with a kind of bell shape U0. So, okay, U0, you should imagine, is just in, this is in, in, uh, in 0, 1, so it's maybe symmetric in, in 0, 1, and uh, it is quite flat, you see it's quite flat, maybe near 0, and it has a change in concavity, so it's like a bell shape. It's, it's just with one single change of concavity. And, uh, and, and with that, then we could describe a bit more precisely what happens. And uh, in particular, we prove that in this case, U is a minimal blow-up solution, if and only if it does not lose the boundary. Condition. So you, we could characterize in, in that for this class of initial data that this losing of boundary con condition was precisely characterized for the minimal blow-up solution. And in that case, there is an instantaneous and permanent regularization at the blow-up time. And really, the blow-up uh, rate is faster. So it, in, in the sense that uh, uh, it's certainly faster than 1 over p minus 2, both, in this case, this is both from the left, which is the blow-up, and from the right, which is the blow-down. And uh, uh, then, then Philippe also worked with uh, Amala Tushi also to find uh, uh, classes of data for which they could also characterize a bit more precisely how faster it was rather than 1 over p minus 2. So they managed to do something a little bit more on that direction. And, uh, uh, and then by, by conversely, somehow U is a non-minimal blow-up solution if and only if it loses the boundary condition. In this case, the blow-up and the regularization occur precisely at the rate 1 over p minus 2, both when it blows up and when it regularizes. And those two times now are different. Now are different. And actually, uh, this rate corresponds to the fact that u leaves the boundary condition linearly in time, so u detaches from, from 0, like linearly in time, and then it goes back also linearly in time at the regularization time. And once it goes back, there is an immediate and permanent regularization after recovering the boundary condition. So the picture for this class of initial data is quite clear. U at the boundary becomes positive for, for a while, for an interval between T star and TR, and then becomes classical again and remains classical. Uh, and, and in this interval, when it behaves like, uh, when it becomes, uh, it loses the, the character of, uh, say, classical solution, it behaves just like a shifted copy, somehow, of the singular profile. 
And this is more or less the picture, uh, if you want, of the solution. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry to say this is not a numerical simulation. This is just something we represented graphically. Of course, you can see it by yourself. But the solution, uh, the solution will remain even in any case. Yes, it's, it's even at initial time, yeah, it, with respect to one half. Yeah, yeah, okay, we, we concentrated just on, yeah, this is absolutely. And you can see from this picture precisely. So you see that the solution starts as, uh, in, okay, in this case, this sounds like a parabola, but it's more, say, bell-shaped somehow. And then it, at some moment, it, it blows up the gradient, it loses, it relaxes the boundary condition, and then it goes back again, and it becomes smooth. And uh, the key point for uh, proving uh, this kind of result is uh, uh, an argument which is essentially a zero number argument. So this is a very classical uh, uh, maximum principle uh, effect which was uh, in particular say initiated in this form by, by Matano and uh, Angenant. Uh, and we apply that to the time derivative of, of u. So uh, ut satisfies a linear equation, as I already mentioned before. So we can apply this zero number property, which means that the number of sign changes of ut decreases with time. And for the particular class of initial data that we choose, uh, since of course the value of ut at zero is related to, from the equation to the concavity also property of the initial data, this, this number is 2 for the bell-shaped, uh, uh, say, particular class that we choose. And in particular, from the even character, in between 0 and 1, one half, there is only one zero uh, of ut. So ut changes sign exactly once for the class of initial data at the beginning. And then we can follow somehow this zero of ut. And uh, so there are just two cases, uh, either the zero of ut that you have initially between 0 and 1 half, so either it collapses at a boundary at a blow-up moment, and this means that ut is non-positive is, is non at that moment, so it cannot lose uh, the boundary condition, and this is why this is preserved, and this is corresponding to the minimal solution, or ut, uh, or this 0 of ut doesn't collapse at that moment, and this may happen, and, and in this case, uh, ut is strictly positive, and it jumps at that moment, and then it loses the boundary condition and becomes positive, and this is the behavior. So for, this is why, I mean, this particular class of bell-shaped initial data allows us to characterize the full picture. And I must say that, not only based on that, there is also lots of work. Philippe with, with uh, Mizoguchi, uh, they very recently they could show that this kind of picture can be repeated as many times as you want for of course different classes of initial data so you can have this kind of bump you lose uh, your uh, your boundary condition then you go back that you may leave as a classical solution again and then you may lose again the boundary so this kind of picture can be repeated uh, and that's very nice also uh, way of seeing that the, the, the basic phenomena that we describe can even be repeated in time and this is a very very special behavior for a second order equation. And uh, okay, so I think I am uh, uh, perfectly, okay, 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 but, uh, okay, but since we are late in the evening I think people will appreciate. <laughs> Uh, I will leave, but I will just uh, conclude by commenting, also, also coming back to the explanation of this phenomena. So, uh, somehow, what I wanted to highlight is that this kind of mixed type uh, behavior, is, which, which comes from the competition between diffusion and, uh, and uh, first order term, which are super quadratic, this means uh, they exceed the scale, if you want, uh, invariance of the, of the second order term in, in symbol, if you want, if you reason in terms of symbols of the operators, uh, uh, then leads to this sort of hybrid model, which is, uh, I think, quite fascinating. I mean, it brings new uh, 
properties uh, between second order and first order. So we have seen many things in this, uh, in this conference uh, in between wave equations and, uh, and uh, say, heat uh, equation and so from, from fractional time. And so this is between uh, uh, second order and first order. And uh, in particular, the two kind of phenomena which are very uh, particular are the loss and recovery of boundary conditions. So I, very quite special for a heat for a second order equation, but also appearance and disappearance of singularities. So I, I suspect, but okay, I, I discussed a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that he's not here, but he uh, completely apologizes with the, with the Hiro Mitake, who was also in the, in the conference. I discussed a little bit with him on other models, which come from uh, maybe a geometric motions like uh, prescribed mean curvature or something like that. Well, maybe something, this kind of phenomena may also be induced by in quasi-linear equations. So not as it was in, in a, say, diffusion plus uh, first order, they might also appear, uh, but, okay, we I mean, this is still a really just a, a suggestion. They, they may also appear in quasi-linear uh, equation, which, of course, might be the generate uh, somewhere. And uh, let me come back on the explanation. So what has this to do with the, with the control problem? Well, if you look at the control problem, you realize that the phenomena we observed, I mean, uh, are, have an interpretation which is quite clear. So you see here what is the, the, the solution. So the solution, of course, is wants to maximize this, this kind of, uh, of setting. And uh, so the, the, the phenomena occurs when you start very near to the boundary. So if you start near to the boundary, you have two options here. So this means that uh, you may decide to exit immediately. And if you exit immediately, well, you know very well that uh, you just, your cost is zero because, okay, so you, you immediately exit and U is zero. And that's the situation when you uh, preserve the boundary condition. But you may do a different choice and you see very well why. You may decide, uh, even if you are very close to the, to the, to the exit door, you may decide that rather than going out immediately, you prefer to take a walk inside. This as a price because the, the Brownian motion, of course, doesn't want to remain inside, so would, would push you outside. So you need to use your drift and even a singular drift. So you are forced to use a singular drift to remain inside because you are fighting against your Brownian motion. But even if you are fighting against the, the Brownian motion, you decide to pay this price because it's not too expensive. Maybe you have a reward to gain here because maybe you remain for a while inside and then you are going to get the best of your U0. You see, so that's the kind of, of game. So sometimes, of course, if you want to uh, take a higher payoff, you need to struggle, so that's... <laughs> That's the spirit. And even against uh, something, I mean, like the Brownian motion that you think, okay, that's going to push me outside, but you can fight even uh, in situation when you think uh, that's, uh, that's not the case. Uh, it, it all depends on the, on the cost function. And it's clear that it depends on the shape of your zero. It's very clear that everything here, this loser boundary condition depends on this competition between how singular, how, how much you have to pay uh, in order to reach a significant value of U0, which gives you a payoff which is bigger than zero. So that's the clear. Okay, so what does it show also, let me uh, take like that, is that you may relax also sometimes your boundary condition and then you, in the end, uh, you, you go back to that. And so this, uh, I think you may take any suggestion that you want. So I thank you for the attention and again, happy birthday to Pier Marco. Thank you, Alessia, for the nice, uh, very nice talk. Are there any questions? Comments? Pier? <laughs> uh, Pier Marco? Just uh, to So you show that um, <coughs> you have one-sided bounds in most cases to for the for the blow up. Uh, sometimes you 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 can say it's 
Yes. Lower and upper. Uh, so it is so rare to have uh, two thousand two si two sided bound for. Uh, well, you mean uh, uh, one from uh, for the regularization and for the blow up, or you mean? Yeah, uh, for example, those, right? You. I mean, in general. You had, uh, yeah. Like, the blow up cannot occur faster than a. Certain yes. Right. Yes. And do you have also a lower uh, estimate? Uh, well, okay, so... Uh, in some cases, I think you did. You showed yes, data. yes, yeah. yes. So in general, uh, okay, yes. In general, you, you have... This is exactly. the, the minimal... Yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, this is the minimal blow-up rate. Okay. And in, in general, you cannot do better because we also have examples where uh, you have uh, this, this is, might be optimal, and other examples where you can be faster. Mm -hmm. So... Um, now I don't know if you are wondering whether there are a mix of this in uh, in what we observed for this class of uh, initial data, but it seems to be a prototype, well at least in one dimension. Uh, we observe that for this class, you either have exactly that for the no for the no yes for the no minimal blow up solutions, or you have faster. Mm -hmm. And we also observe that this was the same for the blow up and for the regu regularization. Okay, this is one dimensional. Of course, uh, in multi-D, I don't know if the U0 is, uh, mm -hmm. of course, this is strongly depending on the initial data. So uh, maybe with an oscillating U0, a very strange, uh, maybe you might have uh, in different directions, uh, different kind of blow up. So we, we, we try to highlight, mm -hmm. at least in this case, what should lead to this kind of uh, rate and what should not lead to this kind of a blow-up rate. Mm -hmm. So in one dimension you can say a bit more, but certainly maybe in more than one dimension you have all directions around a point, so the situation might be very weird, possibly. Okay, thank you. Hi, thanks for this nice talk. Uh, I was just just wondering, uh, maybe you say that at some point, but uh, the, you can, can can you prove something like uh, if the L infinity norm of u naught is more than you don't have a blow up or something like that? Yes. Is, is it correct? Is this is this what is behind the fact that you are uh, eventually going into the nice regime or? Well, uh, it, it depends also on the. On the on the regularity of the gradient of u zero, I ah, think. Okay, so, I so think you need uh, that. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I think it should play a role, but uh, no, I mean that, that, that's a good question. That's a reasonable question uh, uh, because uh, somehow this is the. Yeah, the singularity is observed on the gradient. Be, be, because to prove that there exists a blow-up yes. is just a, yes. a matter of L-infinity norm, yes. right? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Somehow, even the global L-infinity norm will tell you that uh, you will have, if it is large, you will have to blow up. Of course, your question is somehow reciprocal. Yes, yeah. And uh, I'm not completely sure that if U0 is, is, is just small, but maybe with a very high uh, derivative, I'm not sure that he cannot blow up, actually. That's a good question. Maybe tomorrow I will... <laughs> no way, we go to the Kalonka. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Other uh, questions, comments? If not, uh, let's thank Alessio again.